Black Dynamite. Talked about it before, so I'll keep it brief. This may not be my favorite comedy, but it might be the funniest comedy I've ever seen. And I'll explain that later on in the video. What makes Black Dynamite a great comedy is that it doesn't take itself seriously at all. When comedies try to include a serious plot within their film, 99% of the time it turns me off. I watch comedies to laugh, not to be forced to watch some sort of melodramatic snooze fest. Black Dynamite doesn't include that bullshit and is just here to tell jokes. It's an extremely over-the-top movie while having great subtle jokes that require second viewing to locate. And while it's not my favorite comedy, it's probably the funniest. Empire Strikes Back. It's not the best Star Wars movie, but I consider it the second best. So, you guys probably know what I have near the top. I will explain why New Hope is higher later, but for now, I'll just kind of talk about the improvements Empire Strikes Back has over the first film. The sequel includes higher stakes, great production value, arguably better acting, but just like A New Hope, it's still a classic with many memorable moments. I would say my only gripe is that the story kind of jumps around while New Hope was more straightforward and linear, which is just a personal preference of mine, but the plot of Empire Strikes Back is still good nonetheless and includes great pacing. Luke's journey in becoming a Jedi is great because we see the main character actually struggling, and we watch him actually learn about the Force instead of, you know, pulling it out of his fucking asshole. In A New Hope, Luke Skywalker is a very relatable character because he dreams of something more and wants to find meaning in his life, but in Empire Strikes Back he's given more depth and now he actually struggles to achieve that. Nothing is handed to him, he has to work for what he wants, and when he faces Darth Vader doesn't magically just become stronger even though he made the choice to save his friends, which came at a cost where he couldn't finish his training, so it makes sense that he couldn't beat Vader. Even though this is a sci-fi fantasy, it makes the movie feel more grounded. It actually plays by the rules that it establishes at the beginning. Han and Leia are still very strong and likable characters, and I like how we get to see their relationship develop throughout the movie. Usually I'm not a fan of the bickering couple trope, but I don't know, something about this trope in fantasy movies works because... You know, it's not the main focus. It's more in the background, so we get a tasteful amount of that relationship. Because if that was the focus of the movie, then I would probably fucking hate it. I don't want to watch a couple bicker for two hours. But no, Empire Strikes Back shows you just enough so you understand the chemistry between the two characters. Oh yeah, and as a bonus, Lando Calrissian is introduced in this movie, and, you know, he's one of my favorite characters from the franchise, so just adds more to the movie. <laughs> Aliens. Unlike Empire Strikes Back, I believe this sequel surpasses the first movie, and... You know, Alien is still a very good film by itself, but Aliens takes that first movie and ups the ante. Instead of just one alien, there are now dozens, including a giant mother alien, and there's this great final battle between Ripley and the Queen Alien. It's just, it's fantastic. Aliens also includes side characters who I personally believe are a lot more memorable. Uh, the, the side characters from the first movie were, they weren't terrible, but I don't really remember them. But in Aliens, I remember Bishop, Newt, Vasquez, Hicks. In Aliens, Ripley wasn't just the only character you could identify with. There were other characters you could choose from. And while I do really like the slower, suspenseful scenes in Alien, I think I prefer the more action-packed sequences in Aliens. Ripley also becomes more fleshed out in this film, and this is the movie that solidified Ripley as one of my favorite characters of all time. Starting on the first movie, she's a relatable character you want to see live towards the end, and in the sequel she becomes a badass character, but at the same time still identifiable. What's great about her is that we see how fearful she is the whole time but she still makes decisions that are very selfless and again both movies have great writing me picking the sequel over the original movie is just personal preference <laughs> taxi driver you're gonna see a lot of Martin Scorsese on this list. He's definitely one of my favorite directors, hands down. Taxi Driver isn't my favorite film from him, but, I mean, it, it's still on this list. This film really dives into mental health, which is something I feel like a lot of movies back then didn't really focus on. Travis kind of goes into a slow deception and madness where he wants to do good, but he has his own way of handling things, and he justifies it because other people aren't trying to make a change. And it's just a classic. I mean, a lot of iconic lines come from Travis Bickle, who's also a very iconic character, and media. And Travis Bickle is just a fantastic character overall as well. Someone who feels like they're forced into vigilanteism because politicians they vote for won't do what they're being told to do. It's a great setup for a character and it was perfectly executed. It's pretty obvious Joker took a lot of elements from this movie and you know, Joker's not a bad movie at all, but Taxi Driver is just on a whole different level. It's better written, I would argue it's even better acted, and overall just a fantastic film. <laughs> Fight Club. 
This is my favorite David Fincher film, so you won't see Social Network or Seven on here. Which are, by the way, good movies, but Fight Club is just something else. While I can appreciate the Social Network for having great cinematography, great acting, and great writing, and appreciate Seven for having a great story and great characters, Fight Club takes each of these elements considered the strongest from both films and excels with them. This movie also has one of the best plot twists in film history, and I feel like the people who are saying that they thought it was obvious are people who heard there's a plot twist before they saw the movie. So they're like extra careful scouting it out, but I didn't know there was a plot twist in Fight Club, so I was actually surprised. <laughs> Under the Skin. This movie's fucking weird. It's great, but first time watching it, I was high and it scared the shit out of me. Especially that scene where that man's skin gets ripped off, holy shit. One of the most terrifying things I've ever seen in my life. In fact, this and Dante's Inferno probably have the most terrifying places of imagery I've ever seen in any film. There's a lot of eerie and creepy shit in this movie. The ending sent chills down my spine. It's just an overall really freaky film. And I did wink to it. Psycho. A lot of movies do this now where they have the main character start out as someone who's not the main character for the rest of the movie. Like, I've never seen a movie this old kill off the main character in the middle of the film, which I thought was a very ballsy move. I've only seen a few Alfred Hitchcock films, like The Birds and Rear Window, but yeah, so this will be the only movie from him that'll be on this list. My favorite aspect of this film is Norman Bates. He's such a fantastic character, and Anthony Perkins plays him so well. Very good actor, he captures everything that Norman Bates is. He's a very timid person, but he could crack at any moment. Some things in here are a little dated, such as the detective falling down the stairs, but other than that, it's pretty solid. The Seventh Seal. I relate so much to Antonius Block. He is such a fantastic character. I'm agnostic myself, so I could heavily relate to him. Questioning whether it's moral just to believe in God because if you're faithful towards something that doesn't exist, there's no harm in it. You know, these are very important questions I ask myself every day and I never really get to see that in film, so I, I really appreciate the film aiming to tackle that subject. Death is also a very good character from the movie. He and Antonius Block both know that he's gonna win the chess game at the end, but nonetheless, he still likes observing Antonius and how he plays is a game of chess. As if he gets a kick out of it, but at the same time, he still respects Antonius. But lastly, this film looks gorgeous. It's very well shot. It captures the atmosphere of the movie perfectly. <laughs> Django. I've talked about it multiple times, I'll keep it brief. One of my favorite things about this movie is that it can take a subject such as slavery, put it in a movie, and still make the film enjoyable and fun. And it's still in good taste, like that is fucking hard to do. Django is one of my favorite characters of all time, I've talked about him multiple times. He's just really cool, and the other characters in the movie are also fantastic as well. Django has a really good cast. Some of you may be surprised that Django is this low on the list because I've talked about it so many times, but there are other Tarantino films that I like just a tad more. <laughs> Parasite. It was my favorite movie in 2019, and some claim it to be one of the best movies ever made, and I can definitely see why. What I appreciate about Parasite the most is that it's very original. Maybe I need to see more movies or books or whatever. I've never seen a setup like this before, and honestly, it's very clever. I also found the moral to be original as well. The rich are nice and happy because they're rich, and the main characters feel justified in taking advantage of the rich because they're poor. It's kind of like Robin Hood, except the movie doesn't try to justify the actions of the main characters. They make it clear that the main characters aren't good people. I appreciate the movie for not making this a black and white situation and have people interpret the movie based on what they believe. You know, it's not a film that's like, oh, rich people bad, capitalism bad, and then they profit off that same movie and make millions. I fucking hate movies like that. I find it incredibly hypocritical. And it's such a simple moral to slap on your film. And I'm glad Parasite didn't take this route. <laughs> the Wolf of Wall Street. Leonardo DiCaprio is definitely up there for one of my favorite actors of all time. Now, I'm not a fan of Jordan Belfort, the character Leonardo DiCaprio portrays, and I did find it kind of odd that Scorsese would have Jordan Belfort himself make a cameo within the movie, because truth be told, he's kind of a piece of shit. But what I like about the film is that it doesn't hold back any punches. The movie doesn't portray Jordan Belfort as some sort of hero or even a protagonist, even when he is the main character. He's still seen as an asshole. And I gotta give DiCaprio credit because he did make this asshole really likable in the film. He's funny, charismatic, and has a lot of energy. The character of Belfort is actually a lot like the movie itself. It is funny, it is charismatic, and it has a lot of energy. It's also got a great cast. You've got Jonah Hill, Kyle Chandler, Matthew McConaughey, even though he's not really in the film that much, and you also have Margot Robbie, who is fantastic as well. Now, do I think this movie is better than Goodfellas? Well, no, but I still think this is a great movie. Both films basically have the same plot, but each have their own styles. Both are pretty different, but I think I prefer the style of Goodfellas more compared to The Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> Kill Bill, The Whole Bloody Affair. 
I've noticed that a lot of people have a preference when it comes to both of the Kill Bill movies, but me personally, I believe both of them are just as good. Originally, Tarantino wanted a four-hour long action-packed film focusing on the story of Kill Bill, but he believed that the movie was too long for a mainstream audience, so he decided to not only split the movie in two, but censor some stuff. You could easily watch a sequel after the first movie, but they add some stuff in the whole bloody affair that's not in the original films, and to me, the additional details make the film overall better. But when talking about the actual content of the film, I love how over the top it is. I love the action, I love the style, the style is beautiful in this film. It's kind of like Sin City where it's like a comic book but it has its own character. But I especially like how the film knows when to be over the top and when to be serious. And best of all we have the character Beatrix Kiddo who I think is a female character we don't see very often. For some reason many writers believe that a good female character has no flaws. And this happens to male characters too, they're called Gary Stews. But it's more prevalent within fictional female characters. And it sucks because I feel like I can connect with a character despite being the opposite sex but I feel like uh, female characters now are portrayed as perfect because, you know, uh, the directors or the writers want women in the audience to feel great about themselves. And really, it's backfired. It doesn't show that women are oh so strong. It shows a false image in order to win some brownie points. And I really wish we'd have more characters like Beatrix Kiddo in the mainstream audience. Beatrix goes through many obstacles. She struggles almost all the time, but she overcomes these barricades and ends up winning in the end. She learns and adapts as she goes along. But uh, yeah, this would be my third favorite Tarantino film, so I got two more to go. Amadeus. It's Mozart, so of course the music's good. It's what it focuses on, kind of. But I'm gonna be honest, when I started this film, I thought I was gonna be bored. I like music, but I don't really give a shit about the history of music. However, the story turned out to be very engaging. Antonio Salieri is a very strong character. He's a big reason why I was very engaged throughout the story, but another reason for that is the cinematography. I love how this movie looks, I love how they shot it, and the character of Amadeus himself has a lot of personality, though I still think I prefer Antonio because he just has more depth. And that's not to say Amadeus is boring. We see him trying to constantly try to impress his father, we see how passionate he is when it comes to making music. Overall, I really love the film and I'm very surprised I liked it as much as I did. <laughs> Citizen Kane. The only reason I was slightly disappointed with this film is because a lot of people call it the greatest film of all time, which I don't believe to be the case. Even from a writing standpoint, I think there are still stronger films out there. But that's not to say the movie's bad. I fucking love Charles Foster Kane. He's such a great character and, you know, I'd probably include him somewhere tied with someone in my favorite characters list. Not only that, and people say this all the time, Citizen Kane is very well shot, despite the time it was made in. The acting is one of a kind. I mean, this clip right here has my favorite line delivery ever. Don't worry about me, Gettys. Don't worry about me! I'm Charles Foster King! My only gripe with this film is that there's this one scene where a bird just starts squawking out of nowhere and Orson Welles actually admits that there's no meaning behind it. It was put in there just to wake up the audience in case they got bored. The movie would be better without that shit, but overall, great film. <coughs> Casablanca. Citizen Kane has Charles Foster Kane and Casablanca has Rick Blaine. He's just fucking cool. Like, he's like Django to me. I like him a lot because he's just cool. Like, obviously they have character, but their charisma is what brings people in. You see that everybody likes him. He's got a good head on his shoulders, but it's not forced. We see why people like him. Obviously, my favorite scene from the film is when everyone's singing the French national anthem. And I like that there's real actual depth within the scene. This film took place in 1942, and during this time, France was still under control of Germany. So the emotions in the scene are incredibly real and authentic. And again, I regret not putting this in one of my older videos, uh, much like how I, I regret not putting Foster Kane in my favorite characters list. I would definitely put this in one of my favorite movie scenes of all time. And I also really like that Casablanca was basically filmed in one setting. You're in this bar for the entire movie, pretty much, and it works.